Racing log canoes, a passion of mine. This would have been the 30th year that I raced on these boats. But this is the first time since World War II these boats have not raced. COVID-19 just made it impossible. As you can tell by the figures on the boats, there is no social distancing. And people are always yelling and talking on these boats. There's just no way that it was going to work. So they canceled the season, despite repeated efforts and skippers' meetings throughout the season to try to get one weekend in. It, it, I wasn't going to go. I mean, I'm the support, my wife and I are the support structure for our daughter and her children and some other people. I'm not doing this and, and coming home testing positive. So it hurts. As I said before, this show was painted before COVID-19 came. I'm not sure if I'm going to have any log canoe paintings in next year's show because I want to make a statement about the fact that we didn't race. Well, all right. So I love the geometries of the sails against the skies. I loved this repeated pattern, the negative spaces, the overlapping of, of sails, the tightness of composition which a telephoto will give you but because they're rounding a mark it's it's a very tight situation and for me there was this wonderful light on the bow wave of this log canoe here as it was coming into the mark and these two boats are, are always at each other's throats competition wise Billy P. Hall and Island Bird Island uh, Blossom sorry and this piece um, this is mystery uh, owned by a, a Chester River man Fran Schauber who owns a sawmill uh, built, there's a long story about these three large boats, JD, Flying Cloud, and Mystery. They are the gold platers. They were the large, these are the largest racing log canoes and intense competition between JD and Mystery here, all built within four years of each other. I have raced sailboats for well over 40 years. I've photographed five America's Cups and several Whitbread starts and finishes around the world races. And I still keep coming back to these boats. But there are classic shots. And they are classics because they're just remarkably beautiful. And this is one such shot with the light bouncing off of the fore inside the jib. Um, the angles of it, the knife blades of the sail, the geometries of the boards and the people to balance the boat and the sails, the masts, just a lot of things that recommend themselves to me as something worth painting. And probably one of the best guys I've ever painted. Just, just a good sky. Um, this piece here is down in Cambridge. Now, we hadn't raced in Cambridge in over 10 years they weren't really particularly fond. Log canoers can be a pretty rough group of people, sometimes pretty crude. A lot. You have ex-astronauts, professors, linguists, farmers, carpenters, artists, builders, all jammed together on these boats. And sometimes it's not the most pleasant of company. But Cambridge was never really happy to have us there, and we stopped racing there for 10 years and then we came back and this was the first year back and that I very rarely ever paint a bridge in the back of something unless I want to specifically locate it and that is the Route 50 bridge over the river there at Cambridge. So, And it's a starting line so all the boats are all on the same pack, tack. They're running for the line and have those wonderful kites which each family that owns the boat has a certain device on it for themselves. Uh, so that's that piece. And then this one here on the end is Mystery again in her blue livery and a boat called Persistence Ahead of Them, uh, which was at one time a Chester River boat but is now up on, on down on the Miles River out of St. Michael's. Again, knife blade sails, the bright white of the sails against the sky. Uh, just a great opportunity for re repeated shapes and rhythms of shapes. So the title of this is Haze Light, Classic Summer Chesapeake Haze and Soft Diffuse Light in it. In fact, it's one of those pictures that you shoot into the sun and it's all silhouettes until you start playing with it with the computer to try to recover a picture. 
This is the oldest boat in the fleet, 1882, Island Bird, um, owned by Judge North, whose great-grandfather, Sidney Covington, built this boat. That's one of the most amazing things about these boats is that families have owned these boats for generations and generations. Um, They're almost like mountain passes through which hundreds of people have passed over the years. They've raced for over 150 years. So this is Judge North at the helm here. She is also one of the smallest log canoes. And they are probably just finishing attack and just getting hit by some a pretty good blow of wind. Cat's paw, puff, flaw. Um, you can tell because there's water spraying up from the club at the end of the sail up onto the sail. If they get hit by another puff before these gentlemen make it out. This boat is in danger of capsizing because you can no longer let that sail out to spill the air. Um, it is what's called a Bermuda rig with uh, spreets which hold the sail out and clubs which are on the outside edge of the sail. They are working their way all the way out to balance the boat because log canoes don't have keels. They are centerboards. They used to be, at one time, work boats for working in close to shore. So it wasn't really until late in their development that they actually started to use center boards. Um, And any time you get two sailboats on the water going in the same direction, you're going to race. So they, even as work boats, were racing to get back to the dock. There is a book that Judge North wrote that Pete Lesher at the museum in St. Michael's and I worked with on for two years um, about the racing aspect of racing log canoes. It's the first book written on them since 1937, I think is what it was, 30s. So they are working their way up the boards. Every log canoe has spring boards, and they will eventually the boat will come back to where they're not dragging their clubs in the water and she's moving. And, and they, can, they can actually get up on a plane, which is ridiculous in these boats because... At that time, the skipper can take his hand off the tiller for a quick second or two because she's just flying, perfectly balanced. It doesn't happen very often. And that hand never comes too far away from the tiller. When it comes time to tack, the skipper will say, after sometimes some discussion, I don't believe in democracy on racing boats. The skipper says, we're going to tack. He makes the announcement. Everybody gets ready. They all get back on their Everything gets up on the boards, all your feet and everything. And when he says the helm is over or helm's a lee, hard a lee, that boat will come up vertical. They will have slid all the way down to inside the boat while it's coming up, turned to face backwards, grabbed that board, pulled it out from underneath this side, shipped it over to that side, sticking that end back underneath the washboards and moving all the way out before the boat can capsize. And it's, it's like a Chinese fire drill. It's, I, I have, the boat that I race on is one of the largest ones, and I, and I work up forward so I can look back at this going on and to shoot a photograph of it, trying to find rhyme and reason and how everybody's working, it's crazy. It, it doesn't work. Many years ago, there was a book written by a gentleman whose last name was Piercy called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. A, a fascinating sometimes slogging type of a book, but I remember a chapter about reading instructions. And the line that stuck in my head was, when, when assembling a Japanese bicycle, one must have great peace of mind, which was one of those odd little translations that, that between languages. But it's very true. When assembling a log canoe, one must have great peace of mind. And these are... This is Island Bird here. This is J.D., built in 1931, and Island Blossom is at the top there. All three of these boats were built by Judge North's relatives, a great-uncle and a uh, great-grandfather, yeah. So what fascinated me most about this was all the wood, all the pieces, because I know how these everything works, and I know how all these masts will be stood up, how all the sheets will be attached, Over the years, the combings and things to keep water out of the boat, oars, all the different colored sheets for different functions. I had mentioned earlier that there are no keels on these boats. There are center boards. 
This is the, it's a massive centerboard on JD. She's, one, she's the longest, largest log canoe. And then more masts. And I had seen this view for years and years, and I finally took a picture of it, and I finally got brave enough to paint it. There were five at Oxford. We race in Oxford twice a year with a weekend in between them, and twice, two weekends a year, a weekend in between them where the boats go down to Cambridge and then they come back. And that's late August and early September, and we get skies, storm skies there like no other venue. So this is one of those days on the Tread Avon with a storm sky that we're racing in. They won't call the races unless there's lightning and thunder. So it it's, can get quite hairy at times. Boat in this painting is the Helen. She was built in the mid 30s, just uh, down Chester River, up Piney Neck, and owned by a good friend of mine, Danny Ashley, who has kept kept her in the most beautiful shape possible. And there's not really a straight line on her, perhaps other than the door. It's all soft curves and angles. Even the transom is is tucked a little bit. On this day. She had had a new cabin built over in, uh, what's it, Kinnersley, I think is the name of the marina off the Chester River, and put her over, and I drove Danny's truck back to where Danny lives on Piney Neck there and waited for him to come up the creek. Well, it took a while to get there, and the light started turning into this really soft, wonderful late afternoon, kind of overcast light, and the water got very still and the reflections just from that day. I did two other paintings of this that were in last year's show, but this was one I always wanted to paint. And it, it to me, says a whole lot about the eastern shore, the flatness of the shoreline, the things growing on it, a classical Chesapeake Dead Rise work boat, and just really nice circumstances. And this is another classic. These are skipjacks. Um, this is the Helen Virginia. I'm working two years ago because I haven't oystered on the Chesapeake Bay in, in, in at least two years. Normally now I'm, I'm hand-tonging or we're power dredging off of work boats, so not around skipjacks, which I love to paint, but I don't get to see them as often as I would like. And it's fun being on them, but you don't get to see them. You're seeing a whole different work situation. And again, late afternoon light, and I did not want to put the whole mast in and paint around all of those lazy jacks, which are these pieces of line here that hold the sail in place. And I just thought, why don't I just crop it and accent this, which I did. And it worked out rather nice. And it has that, that late fall light where the water is much more blue than the sky could ever be. All right, so more classic Chesapeake boats. This is a Bug Eye, recently rebuilt, refitted um, at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in St. Michael's. She is a log built, log bottom, log built boat, much like the log canoes are, and they did something that had not been done since the late 1800s, which was basically build a brand new log bottom to a bug eye, and she was built in the 1890s. When they took the mast out of her, it still had the silver dollar at the bottom of the mast in it. At this point in time, she's been in the water for several days now. When you first come into the gallery, there is a painting down there of the Edna Lockwood, which is her name, the day that she was put over. So she's still on the railway in that painting, soaking up the water because these logs need to get wet and soak up and then become watertight, basically. And I, to me, a fairly classical image, which I usually shy away from, but I really liked all of these smaller boats, this wonderful sweep up into the bowsprit. And I normally don't paint ducks in my picture, but there's these three on, on this float, which they were, the men were using to do the rigging, um, it, it, it all worked out nicely. It, it made for a very nice painting. And the water and the reflections, just, you know, a lot to recommend itself to be a painting. Okay. So traditionally on skipjacks, you would have either a, a cook who is a black man or you would have um, mid-deck crew, amongst which would be black men too. 
in the winter, there were a lot of blacks that worked on skipjacks. Last winter, I had the opportunity to go oystering down out of Mount Vernon, two and a half hour drive from here. And you meet at a store like uh, Royal Farms, and there was this big knot of black watermen standing in front. And I just kind of stood off to the side. They were telling stories on each other and joking and, and whatnot, but they were all the crews on three different skipjacks that were just waiting to scatter to their various docks and go oystering that day. And after having been down there three or four times, I no longer had to stand on the outside edge because they knew who I was oystering with. And we could, they would tell stories on the guys I was oystering with, but they didn't know me long enough to tell any stories, fortunately. So this is the H.M. Krentz. Out of St. Michael's in the summer, her owner, Ed Farley, um, does a lot of skipjack cruises. Um, I forget, there was a phrase for this years ago. Dude jacking is what I call it down here because up in Maine, there are dude schoonering up there where they, you get on a schooner and you go for a two or three day trip. I call it dude jacking down here because it's a skipjack. And so he's, he's the foredeck man and, his, and basically his general crew uh, on the boat when he's not oystering. There's a boat builder on Tillman Island named Johnny Kinneman, and in the last 50 years, he's probably built over 300 boats. This was his last boat that he was going to keep. He's had many boats that he said was his last boat, and people, he has a very loyal following, always managed to buy it from him. His son tells a great story about the last boat and a buyer came, and Johnny said, no, you didn't hear me. I, this is my boat. I'm not selling it. And the gentleman went back to his car and brought, came back with an envelope full of $100 bills, and <laughs> Johnny sold the boat. So having been through that several times, and at his age now, because he's 86, he wanted to build a boat for himself. So that's this boat that's in the process right now. And he put a lot of neat little things in it that he's always wanted to put into his boats, which he's done. And I had, through the graces of a young lady, a writer at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, they, she told me about Johnny Kinneman and a boat that they were building. I made the connection. I went down. This was my first day being around Johnny in the boat shop and just kind of new to it, so I'm shooting lots of things that I hadn't really seen before because I had never seen a dead rise workboat being built. And we walked around the front of it and he leaned up against the door jam, looking back into this building with his last boat in it and the context and the poetry of it just, uh, I, I shot the pictures and, and I knew it was going to be a painting when I shot it. It doesn't happen very often, but this was one such image. This is the finished boat, and this is Johnny Kenneman standing in front of his boat, which he named the Bourbon Street Lady. Barely enough room on the transom to paint the name. And she's called that because when he mustered out of the Navy in, in the early 50s, it was at New Orleans where he mustered out, and he must have been quite a character to come home with enough memories to name his last boat the Bourbon Street Lady. So she is still in the building. She's on her trailer now, ready to be pulled out, and there'll be more work to do on her. Last week, I went crabbing with him on the boat, so now I have pictures. It's, it's this one long, incredible story that I've wanted to tell for a long time about building a boat, let alone the man who built so many boats and has this reputation. And it's a wood boat, glassed over in fiberglass, very successful. He'll tell you he's successful because... He builds cheap boats, <laughs> so I, I don't think that they're quite cheap boats. Um, I mean, they're reasonably priced, and he's built a lot of them, which is why they're very popular. And you will see his boats all over the bay. Two years ago, I'm in Queenstown at the D in Centerville at the DNR office. We're renewing our licenses because I have my own title, commercial fishing license. And usually there's a crowd of watermen waiting their turn to go up to the counter and, and pay. And they all started talking about Johnny Kinneman's boats. And, and, and then I got to meet him later that year. It was just providential, let's put it that way. And you would be hard-pressed to find a more gentle, generous, funny waterman. Just, just a really good human being. Nice guy. 
This piece is called The Farrier, which is, for those, it's new, whole new language, whole new subject matter for me, is somebody who takes care of, of horses and, and of the shoeing and repairing. And he, this was a, a remarkably hot day. It was in the high 90s. I'm out near Damascus, Maryland, western Maryland, at a gentleman's horse farm. This very same gentleman I ride the springboards with on the log canoes, so there's this wonderful connection of things. And they invited me out years ago to come watch the events, uh, eventing, which is dressage, um, arena jumping, and cross country. Well, it was remarkably hot that day, and I'm sitting in the, in the open door of this bank barn, which is a barn that's set into a hillside, so it's remarkably cool down below and that coolness wells up through the barn. And we're talking, and we're talking, and he gets up and he says, I have to go shoe a horse. And I asked if I could go down and, and watch him do it, and he said, yeah, no problem. So I went down through this wonderful war and passages with all this really neat light, which I'll have to revisit sometime. And I get down there, and he's already started to work on this horse with this remarkable light coming in from the open bay of of stalls and I knew this was going to be a painting also so I shot a whole bunch of pictures and this this one set it off for me and not a whole lot of wide angle distortion because of where I'm shooting from and the angle film plane all of that it um, it said everything I wanted a picture like this to say so I painted it every year I give I let my wife pick a painting out of the show she gave me this opportunity f almost 40 years ago now to pursue artwork instead of working in the sand mine or other jobs. And in order to say thank you to Phyllis, the love of my life, I let her pick the painting that she would really like to have. And she picked this one. And part of me we went, yes, because this is an important painting. We're back at, at this farm. It's called Weredaka, W-A-R-E-D-A-C-A. -E -A -A. You can look it up online. They host nationally sanctioned equestrian events. So these are high-powered Olympic class riders that are competing also with neophytes and beginners. But in this case, in this series of jumps, and this is called a trachener. It's a Russian word. I have no idea what it means. But it's a pretty serious jump, given the size of the log that this rider is clearing. And it's over a trench. And I asked Bob, the owner, if I could get down in the trench and shoot pictures. And he said, yeah, but don't get underneath the horse where they're jumping. I said, that's not a picture I want, uh, but I want to be this way. And he said, yeah, sure, but don't stand up when the horse is coming up because you'll spook the horse. So as the horse is approaching, pick your position and stand still and shoot from there. So, which I did, and I got some pretty remarkable shots, but the first time I went out there three years ago, I shot a lot of pictures which were so-so. I thought they were great, till a, a local equestrian lady, Mary Phelps, looked at them, and she's going, junk, junk, and I'm going, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute, tell me, educate me. She said, okay, and I'm, this one is a good picture, because the feet are together as the horse is leaving, the feet are together as it's going over the obstacle, and the arms are parallel with the reins. All of this I learned from her by going through my photographs. So I lucked out and got a, a really nice photograph on a very hot late afternoon day, sitting down in the trench. Uh, the trench reminds me of World War I, trench warfare. This event was a carryover from military horsemanship. So there were a lot of cultural and, and odd ties that come together for me, as in most of my paintings. These two pieces were painted as a set, and they're titled Sforza Left, Sforza Right. Sforza was the family that were contemporaries of the Medicis. Then the Medicis were in Florence, the Sforza were in Milan. And actually, I'm reading a biography of Leonardo da Vinci right now, and he went from Florence to Milan and was commissioned to do this gigantic bronze of this horse. And it's always been in my mind for years and years. Well, going out to wear Dhaka and watching dressage and arena jumping, 
and cross country. Um, dressage is by far the most esoteric and somewhat mysterious to somebody who doesn't ride and who doesn't compete. But I remember the drawings that Da Vinci did for the horse, for the sculpture, and the horse's head was pulled in tight. And I mentioned this to a dressage rider, and they said, yeah, that's called the collected. The plane of the forehead has to be 90 degrees to the ground. So I started shooting that because I wanted to do these very tightly cropped compositions of these heads in here that are almost like jammed in by the composition. The background, this nebulous olive green, blue green, blue yellow, came from another famous painter of horses, George Stubbs, late 1700s, um, an incredible master of painting horses. But he also did a whole series of etchings about the biology of horses and the anatomy of horses, from bones all the way through sinews and muscles, tendons, organs, flesh, hair, all the way up. And I have a copy of this. Dover printed a, a reproduction of it in paperback. So I, I have these resources to go back to because there is this incredibly rich tradition, obviously, of painting horses. Two different horses, two different frames of mind. This is after the competition, still in the arena. And this is when the rider and horse come up and salute before they start their routine. And you can see the different focuses. And just a little bit more relaxed in one, and the other one, ears totally pricked forward and intense. I like the two against each other. They can be exhibited back to back, but I like face to face in that. So this is Henry. He's the farrier that was in one of the earlier paintings. And you can see his, they all have these remarkable tool shops built into their trucks. And this is a hefty investment in all kinds of, of tools, uh, electricity, generators. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing for the fiscally timid like a log canoe by any means, or even a horse. You do know the joke about horses, how to make a million dollars with, with horses, start out with five million. So a farrier is very important to all events. And there are people constant. Well, that was during an event where he is shooing that horse there. So we're sitting in this 90 degree plus day in the bay of this barn, enjoying this cold air coming up from the lat down below. And he's got his two dogs with him. And I, I'm a dog person. And there was something so unpretentious, so comfortable and natural about him sitting with these two dogs. I just took three or four quick shots and, and I knew I wanted to paint one. I don't know why, and I don't care. I worked at it hard and it made a, a good painting. Good dogs, his face has this little bit of light bouncing off the vehicle into his eyes, so there's almost this you know, the cold glare or something that's in there. But that's Henry and, and his dogs. Mm -hmm.